So chapter 40 is the first chapter in our ecology unit, and it's a pretty broad introduction to ecology and distribution of organisms like the title says. So we'll talk about the different scales, we'll talk about climate, we'll talk a little bit about biomes, but largely I'm going to give you a supplemental PowerPoint because people tend to do okay on those. Um, and so typically I don't lecture over the terrestrial biomes so much. Then we'll talk about distribution of organisms, demography, and how populations grow. So if we talk about ecology itself, ecology is the study of the interactions between um, organisms and their environment. So we're looking at biotic and abiotic interactions. If you remember, bio means life and a means without. So biotic interactions are living things and abiotic is non-living things, the environment itself. So these interactions determine the distribution of organisms and their relative abundance. So like how many of them there are. In modern ecology, includes both observation and experimentation and when we say ecology really there's different scales of ecology there's organismal ecology population ecology community ecology and ecosystems ecology so let's review um, we've got some pictures here of uh, clownfish in the environment so if we look um, at the pictures here and match them to organism population community ecosystem um, an organism is an individual so the single clownfish by itself is the organism so one is C and remember a population is a group of organisms that can interbreed in a specific location so um, members of the same species so A is going to be our population example and then if we look at the pictures B and D they're a little hard to tell just by the pictures because like obviously the water is included in all of these pictures and so B is trying to show us only living things and then D is supposed to include living and non-living. So B, um, community ecology is supposed to be B, <laughs> sorry that was poorly worded, and then D is supposed to re represent ecosystem ecology. So kind of some examples, if we're talking about organismal ecology, that would include um, physiological, so how organisms function, evolutionary ecology, and also behavioral ecology. Population ecology looks at anything that affects a population size over time. Community ecology is when we have different species interacting together. And then the ecosystem ecology is really going to focus on energy flow and chemical cycling and um, the different biotic and abiotic components of the environment itself. And then landscape ecology is kind of the next level. That looks at exchanges of energy materials and organisms from across multiple ecosystems. So landscape or seascape is a mosaic of connected ecosystems. And then global ecology is going to examine the influence of energy and materials on organisms across the biosphere. So on right, a global scale. So let's go over some examples and match them to the um, particular type of ecology. So number five says includes physiological ecology, how organisms are physiologically adapted to their environment and behavioral ecology, so how individual behaviors contribute to fitness. So is that ecosystem, organismal, community, or population ecology? Five, I think, is a little bit tricky between the difference between organismal and population, but this is going to be B, organismal ecology. Number six says studies of how populations of species interact include studies of succession. So six is talking about multiple populations, so that's going to be C, community ecology. Seven says studies flow of energy and chemical cycling. Um, that one's, I think, relatively straightforward. That one is going to be ecosystem ecology. And eight says focuses on groups of interbreeding individuals. What is a group of interbreeding individuals? That's a population. Um, so it focuses on groups of interbreeding individuals with the goal of understanding factors that affect growth and density. Again, that's going to be D, population ecology. So the environment affects the distribution of organisms and the distribution pattern and abundance of a species are going to be limited by both physical features of the environment and other organisms. Physical features of the environment would include things like sunlight intensity, air circulation patterns, precipitation patterns, bodies of water, mountains, temperature, um, water and oxygen availability, uh, salinity, apparently I felt sunlight and availability and intensity twice, but it's pretty important, um, and then rocks and soil. And the long-term prevailing weather conditions in an area make up the climate, and there's four major physical components of climate that are temperature, precipitation, sunlight, and wind. So global climate patterns are determined largely by solar energy and the planet's movement in space, and um, we could talk a lot about this, but just like everything in this class, this is like a little teeny tiny introduction. Um, but there's latitudinal variation in sunlight intensity, 
Um, what is latitude? Remember latitude and longitude? So uh, latitude is the around way, like the equator way. Um, so there's variation in sunlight intensity because the Earth is curved. There's also global air circulation and precipitation patterns that are initiated by intense solar radiation that's near the equator. And then there's variation in the speed of the Earth's rotation at different latitudes, so that results in the major, major wind patterns. So again, the Earth's shape causes this latitudinal variation in sunlight intensity. Um, you get more intense light at the equator and less intense light um, either above or below that because the sunlight strikes Earth at more of an oblique angle there and it's more diffuse light that you're going to get. We also have global air circulation and precipitation patterns that are initiated by that really intense solar radiation near the equator. So warm, wet air is going to rise near the equator and that creates precipitation in the tropics. And then dry air is going to descend at 30 degrees north and south latitudes and that causes desert conditions. And this pattern of precipitation and drying is repeated again at the 60 degree north and south latitudes and the poles. And then variation in the speed of Earth's rotation at different latitudes is going to result in the major wind patterns. I don't care that you memorize this so much, but the trade winds blow east to west in the tropics and the westerlies blow west to east and more temperate zones. So here's kind of a picture that shows you um, that pattern with the trade winds and the westerlies. Um, and also we've zoomed in where you can see um, like at the equator, um, you can see at the equator where you have this um, warm, moist air. So this diagram shows you the um, trade winds and the westerlies, and it also does a good job. It zooms in on like the equator and shows you um, the ascending moist air releasing its moisture and causing rain, and then descending dry air um, absorbing moisture and causing those arid or desert zones. So climate's not just global, um, there's also regional effects on climate. Climate is affected by seasonality, large bodies of water, and also mountains. So seasonal variations of light and temperature increase steadily toward the poles at high latitudes. This is caused by the tilt of the Earth's axis of rotation and its annual passage around the sun. And there's belts of wet and dry air straddling the equator that shift throughout the year with the changing angle of the sun. As far as bodies of water goes, um, the ocean, their current, and large lakes help moderate climate. Um, I feel like people sort of have an idea on that already. Like that's why lots of people go for, you know, vacations by large bodies of water. So during the day, air rises over the warm land and draws a cool breeze from the water across the land. And as the land cools at night, air rises over the warmer water and draws cooler air from the land back over the shore, which is replaced by warmer air from offshore. So you've got this nice um, moderate climate nearby these large bodies of water. So also the California current carries cold water southward along western North America and the Gulf Stream carries warm water from the equator to the North Atlantic. Mountains also have an effect on climate. Rising air releases moisture onto what's called the windward side of a peak and creates something called a rain shadow as it absorbs moisture on the leeward side. So if you've ever been to um, someplace with large mountains um, and if you go to one side of the mountain, it's very different from the other side of the mountain. So there's actually many deserts that are found in the rain shadow of a mountain. Mountains also affect the amount of sunlight reaching an area. In the northern hemisphere, for example, south-facing slopes receive more sunlight than north-facing slopes, and it's basically the opposite in the southern hemisphere. There's also something called adiabatic cooling, where every 1,000 meters increase in elevation produces a temperature drop of approximately 6 degrees Celsius. So you can see as um, the air rises, it expands and cools, and then as air sinks, it contracts and heats up. Um, so there's a figure showing a little thermometer and also a little graph um, for that as well. So biomes are major life zones that are characterized largely by the vegetation type, if they're terrestrial, so on land, or the physical environment if they're aquatic. Um, so we're going to just kind of really briefly go over biomes because most people tend to do well on this section. Um, and there's another supplemental PowerPoint that I probably won't narrate. Um, usually I just provide that for people to look at. So 
Climate determines the type of vegetation and also limits the distribution of the terrestrial biomes. Um, the latitudinal patterns in terrestrial biomes reflect that latitudinal pattern of climate. And a climate graph is a little handy graph. There's a picture of it I'm on the right hand side here um, where you look at mean temperature and precipitation in a region. So in this climate graph you have mean annual or sorry, annual mean temperature for your y-axis and annual mean precipitation for your x-axis. And you can see something like a desert has um, low precipitation and they can have a range for temperatures. There's hot and cold deserts. Um, something like a tropical forest though, gonna have lots of precipitation and a high temperature. Um, then like Arctic and Alpine tundra, right, they're going to have um, low temperature and lower levels of precipitation there. So biomes are affected not just by average temperature and precipitation, but also the pattern of temperature and precipitation throughout the year. Disturbances are gonna alter the distribution of biomes. A disturbance is an event that changes the community by removing organisms and altering resource availability. Disturbances can be natural or human caused, and you know, disturbances are not all bad. Um, for example, frequent fires kill woody plants and can prevent a savanna, so like a grassland with few trees that are widely spaced from transitioning into a woodland. And here, I honestly just put this picture in because I found it to be visually appealing, but this does a good job showing you um, how fire can alter an ecosystem. So this ecosystem in South Africa relies on periodic fires um, to help kind of rejuvenate itself. So biomes are typically gonna be named for their major physical or climatic factors and also for their vegetation. And their major features include their global distribution, so where we can find them, their mean annual temperature, mean annual precipitation, and the dominant species of plants and animals. Um, also, some biomes have vertical layering as an important feature. And if we look at like a forest, the forest has an upper canopy, a lower tree layer, a shrub or understory, um, and then a layer of leafy plants, like herbaceous plants, um, and then the forest floor, and then there's a root layer as well. So this, this layering actually provides um, more habitat than, than if we didn't have this layering. So it provides kind of a diverse habitat. They're all different at different layers. So an ecotome is when um, a terrestrial biome grades into another um, without kind of sharp boundaries. If you think about the edge of a forest or the edge of the woods um, where it comes up to the grass area, it doesn't just like, unless it's man-made, right? Man-made, sometimes it does just go right straight, here's the edge and then here's the grassland. But really you have like a, a more densely wooded area and then kind of some shrubby stuff and then sort of grassy stuff. So that area um, of intergradiation is called an ecotone and you could have a wide ecotone or a narrow ecotone. But for example, in this forest grassland kind of ecotone here, you would have both forest and grassland species in that middle area. So aquatic biomes then would be in water um, and features of aquatic biomes include their physical and chemical environment, their geological features, their photosynthetic organisms, and their heterotrophic organisms as well. Aquatic biomes show less latitudinal variation than terrestrial biomes, and aquatic communities are distributed according to water depth, the degree of light penetration, because um, light doesn't really go through water um, after a certain point, also the distance from the shore, and whether they are found in open water or near the bottom. Aquatic biomes include wetlands, estuaries, lakes, streams, rivers, intertidal zones, coral reef, and open ocean. So there's lots of different ways we can look at aquatic biomes. Aquatic biomes are stratified into vertical and horizontal zones. The photic zone and the aphotic zone are one way we can compare zones here. Um, remember a means without and photic is referring to light. So the photic zone has light that's sufficient for photosynthesis um, and the aphotic zone relieves little light. Then you have the littoral and limnic zone. The littoral zone is close to the shore and has the, like the plants have the ability to root in this zone. And the limnic zone is in open water and light is available for photosynthesis here, but plants can't actually root. Um, and then in oceans and most lake, there's a temperature boundary called a thermocline that separates the warm upper layer of water from the cold deeper water. And I feel like you have probably experienced that if you've been to the lake and like jumped in. You know, you jump maybe off of something in the middle. 
So maybe off of another boat or something like that, right? You jump off of it and at first it's warm and then if you keep going down, it's pretty chilly. So you've probably experienced a thermocline before. And here's just a picture of that. So you can see in the littoral zone there, you've got your aquatic plants that are rooted in, limnic zone, um, there's not the ability for the aquatic plants to root in there. You've also got the photic zone where photosynthesis can occur and the aphotic zone beneath that where um, the light does not penetrate. Wetlands and estuaries are some of the most productive habitats on Earth. They support a lot of producers, meaning they can support a lot of consumers, and they support these producers because they have a high nutrient level. They do, however, have low dissolved oxygen levels because of their high productivity and um, decomposition levels. So plants in these areas need to be adapted to growing in periodically anaerobic or oxygen um, low soils that are saturated in water. So wetlands um, are inundated by water at least sometimes and support plants that are adapted to these water saturated soils. Um, these occur along shower, shallow basins, along flooded river banks, or on the coast of large lakes. Estuaries are this kind of transition between the river and the sea, and the salinity level varies there with the rise and fall of the tides, um, and so plants need to be adapted to that and other organisms as well. And this includes a complex network of tidal channels, islands, and mud flats. So here's a basin wetland in the United Kingdom, just if you needed an image of what a wetland looks like. So lakes vary in size from a few square meters to thousands of square kilometers. And I mean, I feel like you know what a lake looks like probably. So temperate lakes may have a seasonal thermocline um, and tropic lowland lakes may have a year round thermocline. And then we can talk about lakes based on their nutrient availability. So an oligotrophic lake is a nutrient poor lake and they generally are oxygen rich. And then a eutrophic lake, they're going to be nutrient rich, um, but often depleted of oxygen. So if you have a lot of nutrients available, then you have a lot of organisms utilizing those nutrients and many organisms are doing um, cellular respiration, which requires oxygen. So they're using up the oxygen. Um, a bit later, we'll talk more about cultural eutrophication, where um, human nutrient release has caused um, artificial enrichment of nutrients in lakes, and that can lead to an algal bloom. Um, and then the algae has a short lifespan and dies, and then organisms that are decomposing those algae um, use up the oxygen available in the water, and then that's going to kill organisms like fish that require that oxygen. So an oligotrophic lake being nutrient poor isn't necessarily a bad thing, and a eutrophic lake being nutrient rich isn't necessarily a good thing. So here's a picture of an oligotrophic lake in Alberta, Canada, which looks pretty, pretty nice to me, I think. So again, I feel like you know what a stream and a river is, but um, streams and rivers have varying environmental conditions from the headwater to the mouth, and maybe you haven't um, you know, been up and seen a headwater before. Headwater streams are generally going to be cold and clear and turbulent. They're going to be swift moving and oxygen rich, and they're often narrow and rocky. Downstream, um, we're gonna form rivers, and they're generally going to be warmer and more turbid. I think people don't necessarily know what turbidity means. Um, Turbidity, like turbid is like cloudy, um, so there's particles suspended in it. Um, and these waters are going to often be wide and meandering and have silty bottoms. And your salt and nutrients are going to increase from the headwaters to the mouth, and your oxygen content is going to decrease from the headwaters to the mouth. Intertidal zones are just like what they sound like. Um, they're the zone between the high tide line and the low tide line. And the substrate for this can either be rocky or sandy, and these zones are going to have variation in temperature and salinity, and um, organisms that live in these areas are going to have to be able to deal with these variations in temperature and salinity, and they're also going to be able to going to have to be able to deal with mechanical forces of wave action. I'm pretty sure that phrase came from our book, and it, it just, I mean... I don't know how many of you have actually been to the ocean and, and been in waves, and some of them are pretty forceful, right? So imagine being a little starfish hanging onto a rock in an intertidal zone and just having the waves wash over you. Um, that could be a challenge for sure. Um, typically in intertidal zones, oxygen and nutrient levels are going to be high. Um, sandy zones are going to support seagrass and algae, and rocky zones support these attached marine algae, and also um, many animals that have structural adaptations like the starfish for just gripping onto those rocks there. Um, so there's a picture of a 
sandy intertidal zone and a rocky intertidal zone there. A coral reef is another one I think you're probably familiar with. Uh, coral reefs form, or sorry, corals form mutualisms with symbiotic algae um, that provide them organic molecules, and then the reef itself is formed from the um, calcium carbonate skeletons of the corals. Uh, coral reefs require high oxygen concentrations and a solid substrate for the corals to attach to. And there's um, shallow and deep sea corals. Um, and the shallow reef building corals live in the photic zone and warm, clear water. And deep sea corals live, obviously, deeper. The pelagic zone of the ocean covers approximately 70% of the Earth's surface, and this tends to be high in oxygen because the water is constantly mixed by wind-driven oceanic currents. And you have turnover in temperate oceans that's going to renew the nutrients in the photic zones, so that photosynthetic organisms are continually getting um, nutrients that way. Um, phytoplankton is the plant-like plankton, and those are the dominant photosynthetic organisms. And then you have zooplankton, which are going to be your animal-like plankton, and that includes protists and worms and krill and jellies and invertebrate larvae that feed on the phytoplankton. Then you also have free-swimming animals um, like squid and fishes and sea turtles and other marine mammals. So the benthic zone is the seafloor. Um, obviously, the the depth of this can vary. Organisms in the very deep benthic zone, um, the abyssal zone, are adapted to continuous cold water and high water pressure. Um, the substrate there is mainly soft sediments and there's some rocky areas. More shallow areas contain seaweeds and filamentous algae. Uh, filamentous just means, means like a long, like stringy algae. Um, there's also deep sea hydrothermal vents in some areas. So these are dark environments that are hot. Um, they come from volcanic origin. And instead of photosynthetic organisms here or photoautotrophic organisms, they have chemoautotrophic prokaryotic organisms that are kind of the base of their food chain or the producers for this system. Um, in this system, you can find giant tube worms. You can find arthropods, um, echinoderms. Um, so those kinds of things can be found in the hydrothermal vent ecosystem or community. If we kind of switch gears here and talk about distribution of species in general, um, species distributions are a consequence of both ecological factors and also evolutionary history. For example, geographic isolation can result in the evolution of unique lineages that are restricted to specific areas. So like Australia is pretty geographically isolated um, and there's uh, unique marsupial lineages there like kangaroos that occur only in Australia and nowhere else in the world other than like zoos, right? Um, so ecologists have to ask questions about where species occur and why they occur where they do. Um, ecological factors, including food availability, predators, and temperature can influence the movement of species outside of their native range. So if we start with the question like, why is species X absent from a particular area, we could say, does its dispersal limit its distribution? Like, can it get to those areas? Um, if yes is the answer, then we say, well, the area is inaccessible or there's insufficient time. Or if we say no is the answer, then we want to know, are there other biotic factors um, that limit its distribution, like other species? So is there predation, parasitism, competition, disease that's limiting its spread? If not, are there abiotic factors, so non-living factors that limit its spread. Um, are those factors chemical or are they physical? Chemical would be like water availability, oxygen availability, salinity, pH, soil nutrients. Physical factors would be like temperature, um, light availability, soil structure, um, fire. Some organisms need fire to, like some plants need fire to stratify their seeds in order for those seeds to germinate. Um, moisture levels, those kind of things would all be physical factors. So like why do we find certain species in certain areas. So dispersal is just that movement of individuals away from centers of high population density or from their area of origin, and dispersal contributes to the global distribution of organisms. Um, transplants indicate if dispersal is a key limiting factor, so that would be organisms that are intentionally or accidentally relocated from their original area to a new area. I'm not saying that this is a good thing to do, um, but transplants indicate a species potential range is larger than its actual range. Um, and species transplants, again, can really disrupt the communities or ecosystems which they're introduced into. Um, so generally speaking, we really try and avoid transplants. So if we look at biotic and abiotic factors that um, limit 
uh, dispersion. Biotic, again, is living. Abiotic is non-living. So biotic factors would be like predation or herbivory or mutualism or parasitism or competition. Abiotic factors would be like temperature, water and oxygen availability, salinity, sunlight, and um, rock and soil type. So temperature limits the distribution of organisms because of its effect on biological processes. For example, cells freeze and can rupture below zero degrees Celsius. If that's happening, you're not going to be able to go there. Um, proteins denature above 45 degrees Celsius for many organisms, so they're not going to be living there either. Most organisms function best within a specific temperature range. Terrestrial organisms um, need water, right? need water. They have a threat of desiccation or drying out, so their distribution reflects their ability to obtain and store water. Um, oxygen can be a limiting factor in some aquatic systems and soils because it diffuses slowly into water from um, the, the air around it. Salinity is a big deal too because your salt concentration can affect your water balance, right? You can lose water um, or you can gain too much water in your cells. Either way, not a good deal for your cells. Um, and most aquatic organisms are restricted to either fresh water or salt water. There are a few um, kind of outliers there, but generally you're going to have fresh water or salt water organisms. And few terrestrial plants and animals are adapted to high salinity environments. So sunlight is another big limiting factor. Um, obviously photosynthetic organisms need sunlight to do photosynthesis, and if it's not available, that can limit their distribution. In aquatic environments, most photosynthesis occurs near the surface because sunlight is more available there. It's not been filtered out by the water. Also shading um, in terrestrial environments by the canopy is going to drive intense competition for light in forest. And then the kind of soil you have is going to um, affect the pH, um, the nutrient availability, and even the physical structure of the substrate can limit organisms. So populations can be described by their boundaries and their size. Um, we can talk about density. Just like in um, physics and chemistry, density is the amount of stuff per unit area. In our case, it's going to be the number of individuals in a set area or volume. Um, dispersion, dispersion sorry, is the pattern of spacing among individuals within the boundaries of a population. And then demography is um, the study of things like death rate, birth rate, and age distributions, um, and how they change over time in a population. We call this vital statistics. So density is actually kind of dynamic in a way. Um, density is a result of an interplay between processes that add individuals to a population and remove individuals. So we add individuals through birth and um, immigration with the eye <laughs> going in, um, and then we remove individuals through death and immigration with an E going out. So I think immigration I in, E exit, if that helps with those two words. Um, and in most cases, it's impractical or impossible to count all the individuals in a population. Um, think of an example. Can we count every red oak in the Mark Twain National Forest? I mean, we could maybe if like time and money didn't matter um, or just the number of people helping us didn't matter like the red oak's not going to move so i suppose technically we could but is it a good idea no um can we count all the deer in the mark twain national forest i mean that's gonna be a lot harder unless we can like round them all up somehow and hold them still or like tag them or something so we know we've counted every single one of them. So typically we don't count every single organism in an area, um, but we do use different sampling techniques um, to get an estimate on um, population size and density. Um, and then if we have an estimate of a small area, we can um, use that to indicate an overall population size. So again, when we're looking at a population, um, Organisms get added to the population with the birth or immigration, um, and then we lose individuals from the population with death or immigration. So um, this particular picture, like I've seen it probably a lot more than you have, and that poor bird who's going to be grabbed by the other bird, he like doesn't see it coming, but if you look on the branch, on the top branch on the right hand side, there's a bird who does see it coming and it's like, uh oh. So, I don't know, that picture kind of cracks me up a little bit. Somebody put some detail into that one. 
So when we look at population density, um, there's lots of ways we could do it. Um, sometimes you will start with a simple visual count and they have little like clickers you can keep track of. So like when you are counting, instead of actually counting, you just click every time you see an organism. Um, and then you look at the number on your little clicker deal there. Um, also, there's different capture methods. Um, that you can use. Um, however, sometimes animals learn to either avoid the traps or actively seek them out if they're food baited. Um, for example, um, sometimes they'll bait traps for catching bears with like jelly donuts, but they can catch the same bear again and again and again because it really likes the jelly donuts. Um, in the pictures here, they've got a quadrant, which is good for plants. Um, that's like a, a meter squared area and you count all the plants in that area. In picture B, they have pitfall traps. So you place, um, you dig a hole and you place a cup. Um, sometimes you, it depends on what you're doing, but you might put um, a layer of something like Vaseline around the edge, or you might put alcohol on the trap. Not like the kind you drink, but like isopropyl alcohol um, in order to keep whatever's in there from crawling out of the trap. Um, mist net would be good. In this case, it's dark, so they're using it for bats, um, but you can do mist nets for um, small mammals or small birds. And then there's a live mammal trap in the last picture and you know obviously your trap size is going to vary depending on what kind of animal you're trying to catch there so these different sampling methods are going to allow us to extrapolate the number of captured organisms um, to the size of the overall population quadrants are you know half meter by half meter or meter by meter squares and th that's good for small plant species um, but you wouldn't want to do something like a red oak like a mature big oak tree because it's going to take up half or more of your quadrant, so not a good way to count them. Um, you could use a line transect method if you wanted to do something like that. Typically you'll use like a 100 meter line and um, sometimes they'll do sampling ac across that whole 100 meter line, um, or you might do a quadrant at 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100 meters. Um, to get an idea of your smaller plant population there. Mark recapture method is another good one. Um, with this, you have to mark animals with the tag or other system so they're recognized when they're captured again. Um, so there's a couple marked animals there. The tag needs to be permanent um, and it needs to not affect the organism too negatively. So environmental and social factors are going to play a role in how organisms are going to be found in the population. Three like sort of general patterns of dispersion include clumped, uniform, and random. Um, clumped dispersion is the most common because resources tend to be clustered in nature. And also organisms that are pro-social um, are going to be more likely to be found together or with each other. Um, uniform dis dispersion um, is when organisms are more uniformly spread out, right, obviously, and organisms that have a particular range um, might have more uniform dispersion. Um, competition for resources can cause this pattern, um, and again, it could also be from social interactions. If you're like, hey, this is my area, you stay out, um, then you can have more uniform dispersion. Random is going to be the rarest because resources are rarely randomly spaced, um, but if resources are super common and abundant in an area, um, you might have random dispersion. So let's label the images with the appropriate dispersion pattern, clumped, uniform, or random. Um, I feel like this is relatively straightforward. I think it's easiest to start with random. No, I think it's easiest to start with uniform. So um, our third picture where we have our nesting seabirds, that's going to be uniform dispersion. And one thing about dispersion patterns is if we kind of look at different levels, we might have things that are more clumped or uniform. Um, right? If we were on our seabird, like our nesting seabirds and kind of zoomed out, they would be clumped on the coast. So keep that in mind. Um, these aren't perfect, but they're just kind of a way to describe patterns. So the last one is uniform. Um, and then if we look at the first picture, the first picture is going to be random and the second picture is going to be clumped. So it goes random, clumped, uniform. So demography is the study of the vital statistics of a population and how they change over time. Demography tends to focus on um, birth rates and death rates because those are pretty easy to track or easier to track. 
So life table is an age specific summary of the survival pattern of a population. This is made by following a cohort um, or it's best made by following a cohort um, which is just a group of individuals of the same age from their birth to their death. You maybe have heard the term cohort before if you are planning on getting into like a selective admission program. Um, like if we take the physical therapy assistance program, for example, the PTA program students, once you're accepted in, um, you take your classes together as a group and you're moved through um, from entrance into the program to graduation, which is a little bit better than from birth to death. Um, then. If we go back to life tables, when we have sexually reproducing species, oftentimes they ignore males because only the females are truly producing the offspring. I know that's a little maybe complicated there, but um, that's typically what they do. It's a little easier to track that way. Um, so you can see here, they've got a life table for the female Belding's ground squirrels. And from the first, um, age period zero to one year old, um, they had 653 to start with. Um, everybody was alive at the start of the year and they had a death rate of 0.614 um, and um, there was an average number of zero female offspring. If we jump forward to the six to seven year range, um, these guys are not, or these ladies, these gals are not living too long. You've got nine alive at the start of the year. Um, in the seven to eight range, you got five alive, right? So we've lost some. Eight to nine range, lost some more. We got four alive. Nine to 10, there's one left there. Um, but think about it, 10 year old ground squirrel, that's pretty old. So a survivorship curve is a graphic way of representing the data in a life table. And really, these are kind of oversimplifying it and not all species fit neatly into these survivorship curves. Some have a kind of intermediate curve or even a more complex pattern, um, but this is just a way to generally talk about organisms. So survivorship curves are going to plot the proportion or the numbers of a cohort still alive at each age. And again, we can generalize them into type one, type two, and type three curves. So an organism with a type one survivorship curve has high survivorship during early and middle life, followed by a steep drop um, due to an increase in death rates among older age groups. Type two survivorship curves, um, they have kind of a rough life. Um, they have an uh, equal chance of death at any age. Um, type three survivorship curves have um, low survivalship due to high death rates for young age groups and stable survivorship later in life um, due to a lower death rate for survivors. So we're going to look at the graph here and I think it'll make a little bit more sense. So if we look at a type one survivorship example, that would be humans. Um, we tend to have good parental care. Um, so our young tend to make it past um, young into adulthood and we tend to die off in adulthood. Um, something like a small mammal or a small bird, man, they have a rough life, right? Um, small mammal, um, can you die when you're an infant? Absolutely, you can. Something can come into your nest and eat you. Can you die when you're running around the field looking for food? Absolutely, you can. A bird can hop out of the sky and grab you and eat you, right? Um, a wolf can snatch you up, all kinds of things. So death rate is equally likely throughout their life there. And then something with the type three survivorship curve is going to tend to have a high mortality um, in their early life. And then basically they get big enough and things can't eat them as easily. And so they have low mortality later in life. Um, so if we look at like a muscle, um, like a clam muscle, right? So a clam, let's say clam. So larva um, get eaten up by all kinds of organisms, but once they get big enough, they're harder to pry open, and so then they tend to be long-lived. So let's match the organism to the survivorship curve it would have. Let's assume that there's like no poaching or hunting and things like that there. So we've got elephant, we've got a robin, and we have a gator. So um, assuming again that there's no hunting and, and no habitat loss and things like that, um, the elephant would have a type one curve because they take good care of their young, they protect them and they grow to old age. Um, what about our robin? Yeah, it's a rough life. You can die as an egg, you can die as a chick, you can die as a robin. Um, pretty much equal chance there. So they're gonna have that type two curve. And then if we look at that gator, um, they do have some parental care, but uh, lots of baby gators get eaten, um, but you get big enough and nothing really messes with you. So they're going to have a type three survivorship curve. 
So that brings us to age structure. Our book doesn't really talk about this. Um, they should, in my in my opinion, but they don't. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about it because I think it's worth mentioning. So with age structure, um, the relative number of individuals in each defined age group can be categorized as either pre-reproductive, reproductive, or post-reproductive. Um, but if you think about, you know, any population, that's that's what they are. They're either too young to reproduce, they're at reproductive age, or they're too old to reproduce. So typically we display this as a pyramid, um, and that helps predict future population growth. So if we look at these pyramids, I mean, I guess they're not all pyramid shaped, um, but the increase in population one is a pyramid shape. Um, so the pre-reproductive group is large. That pre-reproductive group is going to grow up into the reproductive group. If they're still reproducing at the same rate, that would mean you get an even larger bottom in subsequent generations. Um, and so that's showing us an increasing population. Um, if we look at the stable population, the pre-reproductive group is about the same size as or only a little bit bigger than um, the reproductive ages. So those organisms are grow gonna grow up to become reproductive. Um, and then reproduce about the same amount. If we look at the decreasing population, you can see you have a small pre-reproductive group. So that pre-reproductive group grows up into the reproductive group and produces, again, fewer pre-reproductive individuals. So that population is getting smaller and smaller and smaller there. So it's kind of like an inverted pyramid. So to calculate change in population size, we need to look at um, the number of births coming in, the number of immigrants entering the population, and subtract the deaths and the organisms leaving the population. And if we ignore organisms entering and leaving, um, we can look at change in population size equal to births minus deaths. So populations can grow either with exponential growth or logistics growth logistic growth, sorry. With exponential growth, this is when resources are not going to be limiting. Um, this is when we have unregulated growth and we tend to see a J-shaped curve. And I'll show you a picture coming up so you can see what I mean by a J-shaped curve. And in exponential growth, the larger the population, the more individuals we have reproducing, so the faster we have um, the growth occurring. So if we reintroduce a population to a habitat, um, where it has no predators um, or where it has an abundance of resources, um, we're going to see this exponential growth. Um, many of you did projects on invasive species and so you saw um, this exponential growth when those invasive species are introduced into an area. Um, some people will say that human population is growing exponentially, although it seems like it's slowed down a little bit here recently and even more so I suppose currently. Um, logistic growth occurs when resources are limiting and that limits the amount of growth. So for most species, resources become limiting as the population grows and there's a carrying capacity, which is the upper boundary for a particular population. And again, I'm going to show you this on a graph so it makes more sense. So that carrying capacity um, is the maximum population size the environment can support. Um, exponential growth cannot be sustained for too long in any population. So um, a more realistic population model is going to include carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity does vary with the abundance of limiting resources. For example, um, if you had maybe um, too wet of a spring, um, maybe plants couldn't grow as well, or too dry of a spring and plants couldn't grow as well, so the things that eat the plants won't grow as well, and so on and so forth there. So um, the carrying capacity can vary um, to some degree with the abundance of those limiting resources. So let's label the images as either logistic or exponential growth. So in the first picture, that's when we had a reintroduction of a species into a particular area. And you can see that it starts off with exponential growth there. So there's no limiting factor. The curve doesn't flatten out and it's a J-shaped curve. Um, with logistic growth, that's our bacteria in a beaker there. Um, there's only so many nutrients in that, um, not beaker, flask, right? Either way. We're not chemistry, we're biology, but there's only so many nutrients in that flask, so there's going to be a point where the growth levels off and um, you get that sort of S-shaped curve. And that dotted line where it says K equals 665, six, um, that is a carrying capacity for that population. So here's another example. Um, so the elephant population in uh, Kruger National Park in South Africa grew exponentially after hunting was banned because um, hunting was what was keeping that population down. Um, will they run into a carrying capacity at some point? Absolutely they will, um, but in this graph they're not illustrating that for us.
life history traits and population density are going to influence um, population dynamics. An organism's life history comprises the traits that affect its schedule of reproduction and its survival. So when does it begin reproduction? How often does the organism reproduce? And how many offspring are produced per reproductive episode? I think even if you don't know the specifics, I think it would be easy to compare something like a mouse um, that reproduces pretty rapidly uh, um, to an elephant that has a much longer gestation period and a much longer period um, until they reach sexual maturity and they produce fewer offspring in one event there. So you can see how that would be a big difference in elephant population versus mice population. So there's some sort of trade-offs um, with various life histories. So organisms have a limited number of resources, which may lead to kind of a trade-off between survival and reproduction. And there's selective pressures that are going to influence the trade-off between the number and size of offspring, again, like the elephant and the mouse. So we can have a species that is an R-selected species. We can refer to them as opportunistic, and they have a high rate of per capita population growth, which is R, but poor competitive ability. Then you have K-selected species, which are sometimes referred to as equilibrium species, and these have more or less stable populations that are adapted to exist at or near their carrying capacity. So these organisms have a lower reproductive rate, but they tend to be better competitors. So a weedy plant um, would be an R-selected species, and something like maybe an oak tree could be a K-selected species. So the study of population dynamics focuses on the complex interactions between biotic and abiotic factors that cause variation in population sizes. We can either have density dependent or density independent factors that limit population size. Remember again, density is the amount of, in this case, organisms per unit area. So if we have a densely populated area, we have lots of organisms in a small area. Um, so density dependent factors tend to be um, biotic or living things, um, and this would be like parasitism or predation or competition either within this species or with other species. Um, and so with this, if we have a, a more dense population, they're going to be more affected by a parasite or a predator. Um, so if we think about like predation, so predators kill few prey when the prey population is low, but if we have lots of prey, it's easy for the predator to pick them off. Um, density independent factors then, uh, the, the percentage of the population affected by them is going to be the same regardless of whether the population is um, very dense or not very dense. So these tend to be abiotic, things like extreme weather events um, or you know, drought, flood, fire, things like that. Um, if you have a forest fire and it kills you know 50% of your mice, it doesn't matter if you had um, a whole bunch of mice in a small area or you know, not very many mice, it killed 50% of them either way. So competition for resources occurs in crowded populations um, and increasing population density is going to intensify competition for resources and results in, let's say, a lower birth rate. So that would be a density dependent mechanism. Predation, again, predators um, have an easier time eating um, prey when there's a whole bunch of them. Um, maybe the prey can't all find hiding spots, things like that. Or maybe there's just enough of them that they're, they have an unlucky one. Um, and then disease transmission rates can increase with increasing population density. Um, toxic waste produced by a population can accumulate in the environment, contributing to the density dependent regulation of a population size. If anybody's ever like brewed beer at home or if you ever are interested in that, um, at a certain point, the yeast in your beer that you're brewing die off um, because they produce too much alcohol and the alcohol is cytotoxic to those yeast. Um, so you can only get a certain percentage of alcohol depending on the um, certain like strain of yeast you're using. Um, territoriality can also limit population density when space becomes a limited resource. And then there's intrinsic factors or physiological factors like hormonal changes that appear to regulate population size in some species as well. So here's pictures of density dependent factors. You've got competition for resources, you've got predation, you've got disease, um, toxic waste like with the yeast, territoriality, which when we visited the zoo, um, you heard about that with the cheetahs, and then intrinsic factors. 
So long-term population studies have challenged the hypothesis that populations of large mammals are relatively stable over time. Um, both weather and predator population can affect population size over time. For example, collapses in moose population on Isle Royale coincided with a peak in the wolf population during one time period and then with a harsh winter condition in another. So lots of times people will say like, oh, the predator controls the prey size or, you know, the, um, the grazing available to you know, the herbivores controls the predator population, but it, it doesn't seem to be that simple. Um, but here's kind of the graph showing you um, your number of wolves and the number of moose and how um, sometimes when you had um, an increase in the moose population, it leads to an increase in the wolf population, but it, it doesn't always pan out exactly that way. So then a metapopulation is a group of populations that are linked by immigration and emigration. So organisms going in and out of those populations. So they're populations that can interbreed and um, local populations within a metapopulation occupy a patch of suitable habitat that's surrounded by unsuitable habitat and populations can be replaced in patches after like that, like a local extinction, um, or we can have them be established in a new unoccupied habitat through migration. So this picture shows us um, some metapopulations for a fritillary, um, I always struggle to say that one, um, but the dark spots are, on, or sorry, the dark spots are occupied patches and the light spots are unoccupied patches and you can see those are all suitable habitats and the organisms can enter and leave those patches and interbreed. So we made it to the end. Uh, we talked about the scales of ecology. We talked about climate. We talked about biomes. We didn't specifically go over terrestrial biomes in a lot of detail, but I'll post a supplemental um, PowerPoint for you on that one. And then we talked about um, the environment's effect on the distribution of organisms. So like limiting resources, we talked about demography and how populations grow.